Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another story from the old time rock and roller. You know, I've received a lot of questions from my subscribers asking what was the state of musical affair in Hollywood in 1974. So let me hit my time machine. It's been acting a little weird lately. I'm going to set the date to February 14th, Valentine's Day, Steve Jablecki's birthday, and we had received a call from The Tonight Show. And that is where our story will begin. So Steve Jablecki's birthday was Valentine's Day. About a week before, we received a call, Steve got a call from somebody at the show asking if he and one of his band members would like to come down and be a guest on the show. Johnny had it on his roster. We were way down on the list, so we didn't know if we were going to have time for a little on the stage spot, or if he was short on time, it was just going to be a shout out. So we were very excited. I mean, to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, come on, that's big time. So we went down to the show, got to skip the line because we were on the VIP list. And we got in there and saw, the, met the producer, saw the whole stage and line up the production. It was really exciting. Well, after being there for a little bit, we did get word that Johnny wasn't going to have time to get us on the stage. But he did do a shout out to us, to Steve and his guitar player, Howie McDonald, who was there tonight to celebrate Steve's birthday. So that was the beginning of well, not quite the beginning of the year, but that's going to kick off today's story because the year just got more exciting as the months went on. And I am going to tell you about it in this adventure. Now, we had met a gal named Valerie who was from Trinidad. Her father was the ambassador to the UN and they were in LA. So I've got a really cool hat that I'm wearing in some of these pictures and I'll stick one up here now so you can see it because she had the hat, it was her hat. And I said, oh Valerie, that hat is so cool. So she gave it to me and one afternoon she and Steve and my girlfriend Cece and I went to the LA Zoo. It was a lot of fun. And here is a picture from that day at the zoo. Okay, I have some questions here for you. Uh, this comes from Miranda Lemon. What was it like being 3,000 miles from home with no income, chasing a dream of success in the music business? Now that's a great question. It was frightening, quite honestly. There were times where we were flat broke. One Sunday, Steve Jablecki and I went around looking for soda bottles and that was in the day you could trade them in and get a nickel or some such amount for them. So we got enough to go to Jack in the Box and buy one Jack burger and we split it. That's how hungry we were and desperate. And Steve had a knack, I guess you could call it, for finding rich women kind of that liked him uh, that would want to take him out to dinner. But he would always insist, I won't go with you unless you take my friend Howie with us and you buy him dinner too. So in that respect, he was looking out for me. It was very exciting though at the same time because we were meeting famous people all the time. 
you know, we were writing songs and it was an emotional time because there I was 3,000 miles from my home and probably by April of 74, I was ready to go home. Uh, we hadn't recorded yet. I was sick of being broke. Uh, hadn't been with a woman for eight months or something like this. And I sent all my stuff home and I called my old girlfriend, Jane. I said, I'm ready to come home. This isn't working out. She said, don't bother coming home because I've turned gay and I've sold all your stuff and given everything else you owned away. So nothing for you here. So you might as well stay there. Talk about an easy decision, right? So I hope I answered your question on that one. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Uh, another question here. What clubs were you playing? Wow. In the beginning, it was very hard to get booked anywhere. I remember one of our first bookings was at the Sop with Camel in Glendale. And it was on a Sunday night. And we showed up and we played. And there might have been 25 people there. And we said, is it always this dead? And the guy said, no, it was packed last night. But and we said, well, who played last night? He said, oh, a group called Steely Dan. Oh, okay. So everybody blew their wad on Steely Dan. They weren't coming out for an unknown act on a Sunday night. Um, we played at Jim Buchanan's club in Studio City. It was called The Bus Stop, and he was half-brother to Roy Buchanan, the guitar player. Um, it was very interesting working at his place. He had some stories. We used to play at, when Bobby Zamora was in the band. He was the, our first drummer from Reuben and the Jets. It was good money. It was a hundred bucks a night, but we played at Nutty Nero's Night Gallery in Montebello. Bobby was of Spanish descent and most of the patrons were there too. But the gig went from nine to 4 a.m. This was a long gig. In fact, the waitresses would sell a bag of what they would call many whites or crossroads to the band, 15 bucks for 30. And, and you would stay up all night playing. You know, we used to not really like people to come sit in with us, but there was a blind guy named Paul and he'd show up, oh, every Saturday night about maybe one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. It, sometimes when he was late, we would be, holy shit, you think Paul's coming? Uh, because he'd come up and he would play Johnny Be Good and we would play it for a, a whole set. And he would, he would go through the verses 50 times if that's what it took. But he was just singing. He was just singing. It gave Jablecki a break. And it was a one song set that wasn't in our, our repertoire. So for a hundred bucks, it was okay. Now you were asking about some of the nightclubs we played at. The Topanga Corral in Topanga Canyon was an infamous spot. That's where Can Heat got their start. We used to take the long windy road out there to the canyon. Man, we had some good times out there but the pay was terrible. We used to play for $100 for the whole band, plus all the beer you could drink. Well, some cool people walked in there because it was Topanga Canyon. And Topanga Dick was his name and he lived out back of the corral. And one night we finished playing and we were driving that windy road and there were no guardrails. And you'd look down and it was, I don't know, it seemed like a half a mile down. Well, we were just, you know, taking our time, going home and in the rear view mirror, we could see a car kind of doing some weird maneuvering. And sure enough, on a curve, this Mustang passed us going really fast. We got about a half a mile down the road just in time to see it go flying off the cliff. So, I mean, a half a mile straight down. We stopped and got out. And 
There was nothing we could do. There was no cell phones. So we called it in the first chance we could get. That was about the wildest thing that happened out at the corral. Now the Sunday afternoon jam sessions at the Topanga Corral, a lot of people came out and there was this 10, 11, 12 year old girl named Deb Ryder who used to live behind the club and she'd come out and sing some blues every once in a while. And she's got a couple of really excellent blues albums out now. You never know who's going to be in the audience when you're playing anywhere. If it's one person or a thousand or 20,000 or more, you always give it everything you got. And I was contacted by Deb not that long ago. And we got to talking and she hit me to the fact that she was one of those people. Actually, she was the little girl who used to get up and sing blues on Sundays. So that was pretty cool. Another club that we played at was right up from the whiskey. It was Bill Gazzari's on the Sunset Strip. He was famous. He was the godfather of Hollywood. And he had a dance contest, I think, every Thursday night for a hundred bucks. We met a lot of interesting people there. Coco and Cha-Cha were the first girls that we had met there that became our fans. But the cool thing about Gazzari's were there were three bands and three stages. So one of the bands that we hung out with a lot and that used to open for us was a band called Van Halen. And we used to party it up with them behind Jack's Liquor Store, right at the corner of Sunset. We had a blast. But the big club we wanted to get in with was a place called the Starwood on Melrose. And we went down there one night and we learned who booked the place. I met my first Hollywood girlfriend. Actually, she was from Santa Barbara. Her name was Cece, and she was there with her friend Connie. And I think it was her 21st birthday. And we were talking on the street, and she said, Oh, look, there's Hubie Heard from Billy Preston's band. And there was a guy in a, sort of a plaid jumpsuit with a beret kind of looking hat and lying out on the stairs. And he looked kind of down, so we went over and she had seen him with Billy and maybe even met him because uh, she knew who he was. So she introduced me to him. <clears throat> he perked right up and he was starting a band with two former singers from Ike and Tina's band. Ike and Tina Turner's former drummer, Soko Richardson. Ronnie Green, a bass player from Greenwood, Mississippi. Hubie played the organ, they needed a guitar player. So I gave him my number for a, a future a future call. So that that's something that really panned out big. Turned out we did two albums together. Cece and Connie came back to my place. Well, it was Jablecki's place, really. But we partied well into the night, had a great time, and Cece and I ended up going to a lot of concerts and events together. We were pretty well set as far as being rehearsed for the band we had played enough crappy clubs lord knows but we were trying desperately to get into the troubadour the starwood and the whiskey and we finally got booked into the starwood and we had a great night there and that that was actually probably the night i met cc and did I answer your question uh, you did but here's another question they want to know what was uh your relation with Betty Davis Eyes. Betty Davis Eyes. Okay. So this was one of the more exciting parts about being in Hollywood. We had met a singer from Memphis. Her name was Brenda Patterson. Sang with the Coon Elder Band back in Memphis after she left Hollywood. But at this time, she got an advance from Warner Brothers and... Her boyfriend was Sam Samudio, better known as Sam the Sham, from Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. 
I couldn't believe it. My first high school band, we played Wooly Bully and Little Red Riding Hood. I can see them with the turban on the cover of the album right now. But, but he did put on a show at the Whiskey that was pretty good. We went and we saw him. Well, one day Brenda came over and she was really excited. She said, I've just heard the best song written by Donna Weiss and Jackie DeShannon. And it's called Betty Davis Eyes. And Donna is going to let me record it on my album. And she said, this song is a hit. It's a number one. It's a smash. It's going straight to the top. And I'm going to sing it. She was so excited over it. Well, they recorded it later that year, but something happened. It didn't get released, and it wasn't until 1981 that Kim Carnes did it, and then it became a number one for a long time. It got bumped out of the number one spot by some rinky-dink song and then jumped back into number one. It was a big hit. So there we were in Hollywood, rehearsing away, meeting people, and we get a call, and it's Donna Weiss, basically the writer of Betty Davis Eyes. She said, I want to come over and play with you guys. And we said, okay, come on over. So we let her in. She came in, and she had an acoustic guitar. And she sat right down in the foyer, just past the hall into the very beginning of the open area. She took out her acoustic guitar and said, everyone sit in a circle. And she proceeded to play and sing, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? So it was kind of a, a mystical night, if you will. I mean, a folky night, but it, it's really hard to describe. But to be sitting there once again with the writer of a number one record, was it worth it being broke? Hell yeah. Was it worth it being there chasing a dream? Hell yeah. It, were, were people showing up to come out and see us and wish us well and hang with us and jam with us? Absolutely. And we had the studio booked right around the corner. Let me get a guitar. You had asked a minute ago about what was it like.
The solo for Cape Town Retreat was really exciting for me. And we had Big Black on the congas. Now, Big Black started Earth, Wind, and Fire. His real name was Chet Washington, but he said, just call me Black, Big Black. So we did. And his conga part really spruced that up, gave me a lot of juice. I just felt so good playing that. It was fabulous, in my humble opinion. So I hope you liked it as much as I did. What a session. I have one more question. Oh, we have more questions? Well, you can edit it. Oh, wait, what do uh, we have? How long did you stay in California before you went back to, say, the Cape, the New England, or wherever? Mm. It was five years before I went anywhere. So you were in Hollywood for five years? Yeah, four and a half, five years. And I almost moved to San Francisco but I'm saving that for another story with the Kathy McDonald band. With so many connections that you had, yeah. why is it that you didn't make it big, big, big time since you had all those opportunities? Well, I think being friends on the local level with artists that are like yourself or have had some degree of fame or success or you know, like this, that doesn't necessarily equate to cash and success. Mm -hmm. That's more of a timing thing, of a right place, right time, with the right manager, with the right agent, with the right band. It's so much of it is luck. You know, when I was a kid and I started playing, I used to think if you became great, automatically you'd get rich somehow there would be a big reward, a payoff. But come to find out, I'd meet guys all the time that played famous solos, that played famous parts, and they were just struggling like me, trying to get a gig, let alone writing their own songs and trying to get a deal. A long time ago, I realized being a good guitar player was not gonna be enough. I had to be a writer, and I had to be able to convey those songs and lyrics vocally. I'm a mediocre singer at best. That's why I always work with the best singers. But you've got to do everything you can to make yourself as indispensable as possible. And being a guy, I had a friend who was like a Tonight Show kind of guitarist. He had read charts brilliantly. He'd show up at work every day like it was it was a day job for him. He'd show up, he'd read music, and he'd get his check and he'd go home and that would be it. Clark Garman. Clark's a great guitar player. But you know, being all head and no soul wasn't where I was at. I wanted to experience it and feel it and then write about it. And that's exactly the way I did it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Kind of? Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for hanging out with the old time rock and roller. It's been great to tell you another story. So keep love in your heart, a song in your head. I'll see you down the story highway on the next video.